I was listening to the story about, it was a story of a family in Washington and the little boy called the Bigfoot the Cowboy Man. And he had, apparently it had made an effort to steal this kid. And it hit me. My children were in that playpen behind me with nothing but a mosquito net over them. It could have crept up behind me and taken both of my children and I wouldn't have known. father just got like a Mustang or something from Wyoming, okay? He had it out in the corral because he couldn't put it in the barn with the, in the stalls with the other horses that would kick and made all the other horses nervous. Had a Seminole Indian working the horse trying to break it every day. So they had it out in the corral. This skunk gate snuck up behind this horse and grabbed it on its hind quarters. This particular horse kicks out, jumps over the corral, runs into the pasture, you know, to get away. At this point, the rancher's out there just blasted away with the dirty, dirty. Skunk Ape runs into the swamp. I went up there uh, one day after that, or two days after that, I went up there and sat in the silence up there and it i'm telling you man it was free it was crazy you know it was it, there was a crazy vibe up there still i did what i could to kind of get things under control but i told her i said you need to get off this property i, I feel like no matter how strong you are it's almost like standing in the ocean you can't stand still without moving your feet you're going to get knocked over eventually no matter how strong whatever you, you can't withstand a barrage of, of weird spiritual energy What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Paranormal Odyssey Live. I'm your host, Wayne. As always, right in the nick of time this week, <laughs> joined by my good friend, co-host, producer, author, mother, grandmother, wife, extraordinaire, Miss Tiffany. You made I'm it, the, man. The whole gamut within 30 seconds to, to spare. <laughs> And I came yeah. in clutch. <laughs> it's uh, it's not that uncommon for you to beat me in, but that did not happen today. Actually, you you got in pretty early. You just had no sound. No mic. You broke it. I, you know, I went in there and I was like, I texted Zach and I said, "Mayday, my mic won't work." And so he said, "He said reset." Mayday. Mayday. <laughs> He said, restart the Mac. And I said, okay. So I restarted it. Well, then it wouldn't even let me open Google Chrome. It was saying it won't open. Do you so leave then I'm your like, computer running all the time? No. I do. And I, I think that's why mine acts stupid sometimes. I was wondering if that yeah. might be the problem. Nope. So I'm like looking through all this stuff. Okay. It's like 940. And our guest is supposed to be in here. Well, I've talked to our guest as well, and he is having issues with his computer. The last message that I got from him is his screen's completely black, so he's starting it again. I reset the Mac three times, and so there there is an update available for it, but it won't let like Zach put the Zach put the update on it. Um, it won't let even it won't let even let him remove the Google Chrome app to reinstall it. So I'm on my phone. Yeah. <laughs> no. So yeah. I can't see any of the, if I pull up the chats and join the chat room, it covers up my whole screen. So. And I haven't seen Naoma this evening. So mm -hmm. that she shows up because we, we normally don't even use a moderator. I mean, we don't even need one because mm -mm. our audience is so well behaved. But tonight, tonight will be the night some asshole creeps in here. And yep. shows their tail, and we won't be able to do anything about it. Yep. So way to go, Tiffany. <laughs> Blaming on me. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> yep. Um, but as you alluded to, we also currently do not have a guest. Yes, and he said, "Well." It's probably paranormal because this happens to me when I do interviews. And I said, yes, this happens to me anytime I'm a part of a paranormal interview. And it is yeah. also because I know this man inside and out as much as I physically can without being creepy. 
and you know, I was going to give all the deets and, <laughs> and then the computer crashed and said, Hey, guess what? No, you're not. We're just kidding. Well, I mean, we still got to pay the bills. We can take our time doing that. And we can talk oh, for a few you, minutes. Maybe, maybe he uh, can get it figured out and can jump in. I don't have the ability to do that, but uh, you can. If you can just put up my little banners for me and I'll say it. <laughs> so you don't, what are you using right now? My iPhone. And why can't if you I, do the... It, um, it won't, it doesn't come up. Like the only thing that I have an option to do is join the chat, turn my camera off and on and mute my mic. That's it. That don't make any sense. Anytime I ever do a show from my phone, I can do just about everything that I can nope. from the computer. Underneath and I'm your really... screen, it should say like banners, brand, and comments. Nope. Hmm. So I, mean, I, don't, I don't mind doing them all. I just it's just weird that you don't have access yeah, to that. The, well, the only thing I can think of is that I am entered as a guest because when you do it from a phone or you do it from an iPad. And I'm surprised it even let me on, on my phone because it pops up this window and it tells you to put the link into Safari, which is all fine and good, but that enters you as a guest. And so I don't have access to anything. Yeah. You I'm just a, a, yeah, I'm just a nobody in a square. <laughs> Miss Lori Wade is watching from Facebook. She says, hello, Wayne. Hello, ma'am. Glad that you could make it. Also noticed a couple other new people in the chat. One of them said that uh, you weren't very hard on the eyes or something like that. Oh, well, thanks. That's awful nice of you to tell me that. Juno Tafoya. Tiffany is also easy on the eyes. Wink, wink. And wink, Troy, wink. Was very, Troy was very quick to let Juno know that Mrs. T is happily married. That's <laughs> <laughs> right. It's that I'm brotherhood. Sure, yeah. If Zach is anything like me, he takes that as a compliment. No, yeah. Don't He's, get jealous. Zach's, yeah, Zach's not a jealous person at all. He's not. Uh, so I'm also, sure that he would. Do what? I was going to say, I, I'm, I'm sure that he would appreciate the compliment that his wife is easy on the eyes. Yeah. Now, you you are an attractive lady. There's nothing wrong with saying that. Thank you. That's right. I mean, I try not to look homeless all the time. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I've caught you on here a few times when you um, look your best. But you, it's still yeah. Bad. Well, then, see, I just snorted. Listen to me. Um, if you catch me on Discord, I'm not always polished and ready. I'm, <laughs> you know, relaxed, kicked back in my chair with my blanket. <laughs> yeah. We also got the, uh, I said hello to these guys, uh, the Cross Files podcast, a.k.a. Strange O'Clock podcast. Uh, they are new to me, and I looked them up because they were in here early, and uh, I'm going to be checking you guys out. If uh, y'all are still in here, I appreciate y'all stopping by. You as well, Juno, and anyone else new that is watching and doesn't want to say hello. And we are feverishly trying to get Mr. Patrick Meekin on. Um, I haven't yeah. heard from him anymore. Did you text him oh. and tell him that? He said, he, yeah, he said trying to log in now, having issues, but making progress. He's trying. He's stressing. He is stressing. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll get through it one way or another. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Y'all got us for an hour, and whether you like it or not. <laughs> That's right. That's all how right. we roll. <laughs> Let's get through all this. All right. If y'all are new to the show, like a couple of people that I just mentioned, please hit that subscribe button. We are very happy to have you. We want you to stick around, but uh, you got to hit that subscribe button, please. If you've had an encounter and would like to come on and share it with Tiffany and myself, there's a couple of ways of doing that. It starts with hitting one of us up. You can get either one of us. Either one of us can set that up for you. We both have access to all the scheduling and 
and all that good stuff. You can get me at Wayne at ParanormalWorldProductions.com or Tiffany at ParanormalWorldProductions.com. So just remember the ParanormalWorldProductions.com and just whichever one you want to talk to. That's pretty much the easiest way to do it. Let's do it. Since, <laughs> since you're remembering the ParanormalWorldProductions.com, that is also our website. Head over there, check it out, pick you up some merch, check out all the other shows, Sasquatch Odyssey, this one, obviously, Paranormal Odyssey, uh, that Bigfoot podcast, uh, the Basement Hangout, Chad and Bob over there, a couple of really cool guys, uh, Kentucky X-Files, Denny and those guys are also really cool, they do a good show, and also uh, a show that I don't mention all that much but i need to because it's kicking our ass in subscribers is uh backwoods horror stories i think uh that one over there is up to over fifteen thousand subscribers and the the podcast is doing really well too i've been talking to brian the last couple of days we are very pleasantly surprised with how the podcast is doing for uh, backwoods horror stories if so if you guys haven't checked that out yet, all it is is Brian narrating encounters. And that's it. He puts up some B-roll for y'all to watch while you're listening. And uh, he just reads encounters that were sent in to him, sent in to me. Uh, he has some, he has access to this lady's, I don't know, he could tell you better than I can, but she has thousands of stories. And he has access to that, so he brings some of those over. It's just cool, cryptid, creepy stories, and shit that happens in the woods. Most of it is Bigfoot related, because we uh, we love Bigfoot around here. But yeah, if y'all haven't checked out Backwoods Horror Stories, please do so. You can get that on YouTube and podcast. But if you go to ParanormalWorldProductions.com, you'll know that. So just head over there. If our guests, well, I'm not going to say if, when... Our guest, Mr. Patrick Meekin, when he shows up tonight, I'm sure you guys will have some questions for him. As always, please do not hesitate to ask those questions, but put those in all caps, please. It makes it so much easier. Uh, Tiffany catches those more than I do. That's one of her jobs. She's on the, always on the lookout for questions. So help her out and myself and put those in all caps. If you don't put them in all caps, they're, we're probably not going to catch it. Even if you put it in caps, sometimes we miss them. If that happens, wait a little while. And, well, I can't say that because here lately we've been saving those and putting them to the end. And I think that's working pretty well, don't you? I do. I think so. It just it keeps the flow. It's nice. Yeah, uh, we had some listeners comment that the questions seem to break up the flow and, you know, to get – lose your train of thought and all that stuff so we've been saving those to the end so just put them in all caps we'll catch them we will star them and put them in our file and the last 10 minutes or so of the show we've been doing like a rapid fire question and answer kind of thing i think it's working it's going really well so we are going to continue to do that questions all caps please please <laughs> because he's doing it all by himself tonight because Tiffany's got her hands tied. <laughs> and he just right. asked me if um, I had sent him the link to the studio this morning. And he, awesome, I think Zach fixed it up. Um, he texted me and he said, you sent me the link in my email, right? And I said, yeah, it's in your email. <laughs> Do you need to send him another one real quick? Um. Well, let me, because I can't do well, anything... If you want to go ahead and if you've got the Mac up and going, if you want to go ahead and close this one out and switch over to the Mac and come back when you're ready, I'll go ahead and finish everything out and be waiting on you. Okay. Works for me, pal. See you soon. Bye, everybody. I'll be back. All right. All right, guys. Since we have a couple more minutes, I want to remind everyone about Paranormal. I'm sorry, about Manimal Research, which is my organization that I founded back in 2019. Haven't been talking about it a whole lot lately, but yeah, it's still up and going. We have the Facebook group over there. We would love to have you. If you are not already a member, head over there, Manimal Research on Facebook, and uh, 
click that join button and we'll be happy to accept you. Yeah, Manimal Research is an organization I'm very proud of. I started it back in 2019. That's when my, no, I've, y'all that know me know that I, I've been into Bigfoot for years, my whole life, really, since a young boy. But uh, really took off in 2019 when I uh, founded my organization. Looks like Patrick is, has just popped in, but we don't have Tiffany back yet. So I'll go ahead and finish this out. Mr. Patrick, just hang on and uh, we will get you out here. But yeah, Manimal Research, I'm very proud of. Started in 2019, still going strong. We're doing our Squatch Out this year. It will be the fourth annual Squatch Out. We already have the date. We already have the location. I have been talking to the husband of the owner, which I guess would make him also the owner of the venue. And we're working out some numbers to, to get that already. That's why I haven't created the event page yet, but it is coming soon. I uh, had a real good talk with him the other day, so he's just putting this a, a package together, but that is coming. So y'all be looking for information on the East Tennessee Squatch Out. Head over to Manimal Research on Facebook and become a member. All right, let me head over here while we're still going. I thought it was going to be a, a quick Tiffany jumping. There she is. Maybe. Are you back, ma'am? Are you? Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Yay! Y'all give it up for Zach because he sat on the floor over here, <laughs> was like cussing this thing out. <laughs> <laughs> Good deal. Good deal. Glad that you got that fixed. So you have access to everything now. I have access to everything. I am non paralyzed anymore. And as you can see, if you look down, you see Mr. Patrick hanging out down there. So he I made it do. in just a few seconds before you did. So I'm sure everybody's okay. tired of listening to me. So if you ah. want to tell everybody a little bit about Patrick, just briefly, we will go ahead and bring him out. Well, um, he's a pretty complex fella. And it, it's so funny. Let me tell you how this worked out. Just let me tell you how this worked out. Okay, he's a trooper, and I'm so glad <laughs> because, as you know, uh, Chad Garcia was supposed to be on this evening, and so Bluey was coming to Disneyland, and Bluey is his daughter's all-time favorite character, so he's like, you know, so I hit him up, and I'm like, hey, do you want to reschedule? And he's like, yeah, so we rescheduled him for the 27th, which left the 6th open. So Patrick friended me on Facebook, and he's an author. And I'm an author. So, like, I mean, we job together. Anyway, so, and then he sent me a message and he said, hey, if you ever, you know, need somebody for your show, I'm paraphrasing, of course. And I was like, well, coincidentally, <laughs> we have an opening. Now, this is last week. I said, we have an opening on the 6th. And he said, LOL, period, cool, period. And I said, yeah, I know that's pretty sudden, isn't it? <laughs> he was like, yeah. And I was like, if you can't, I completely understand. It's like last minute. And I like to give our guests time to prepare. And he was a trooper. He was like, you know, I live this, you know, this was my life. So I don't need time to prepare. I'm pretty, you know, I'm good. So, um, yeah. but yeah, he is an author. I sent you those uh, pictures of his book was, were you able to get that up there? They are. I got them ready to go. Okay, um, so he is the author of Nightmare in Holmes County. Um, he is also the author of 202. Oh, my land. Oh, that picture is not up there. Um, I'm sorry. One, I'm having 220. Oh, there it is. Well, I can't yeah. see it. 225th Street. And he is also the host to Stranger Than Fiction podcast that can be found on YouTube.com and Rumble.com. On top of all of that, he is, let's see, author, researcher, deliverance minister, filmmaker, and podcasters. So, I mean, he's the whole gamut. He's a busy man. He's the man. whole gamut. Busy. Busy man. And I, I listened to him on a couple podcasts like, I listened to part of it because I didn't want to know 
everything, right? So I listened to him on one, and then I saw that he was on Into the Fray with Shannon. I love her. So of course I listened to that one. Um, so yeah, but I'm interested in hearing the rest of everything he's got going on within those books. Because those are those are true books about his life. Awesome. Yeah, yeah uh, we are 20 minutes in. Normally we like to get our guest out uh no later than 10 minutes in but we had the difficulties tonight but i'm sure patrick is like the rest of us he enjoys hearing nice things about himself so we let you uh <laughs> let you give a brief intro but we're gonna go ahead and bring him on yes patrick how you doing sir i'm doing well and uh, thank you for your patience sometimes when i do interviews strange things happen and uh you know uh I had all kinds of computer issues, so it's kind of hard yeah, for the well, course. It, it, here's you, the thing, uh, though. Some interviews I've done, the people interviewing me had just flat out paranormal things happening during the interview. So, really? uh, yeah, you, you know, some, some technical difficulties is a little more tame mm -hmm. compared to some things. Well, thank you yes. for your perseverance. A lot of people, and we've had people in the past that would just say, screw it, it's not working and just reschedule but you uh hung in there and, and we greatly greatly appreciate that i'm very excited to to have you on tiffany has been talking about you quite a bit she uh been bragging about your work and i can't wait to, to hear you talk a little bit about it if you don't mind patrick start at the beginning tell us what got you interested in the spooky i mean was it something that happened to you or just the interest or, or what happened Okay, well, I want to say up front, you know, uh, all the things she said, author, deliverance minister, etc., podcast host, whatever. The bottom line is for me, I went through these experiences. They are real. They are very real. I know what it's like to be the one who's living in the haunted house and, and uh, dealing with all kinds of demonic attack and oppression. And I know the extent of how horrific and like uh, just horrible emotionally that can be because you're under a massive attack. So because of that, you know, um, you know, I want to, I want to share my story because I, I know what it's like to go through it. And I think by sharing my story and what, how I dealt with those situations will help others. And along the way, I have had people contact me over the years, many times needing either their house needs cleansed or they need cleansed. I mean, there's people that get demonic attachments or full on possession. You know, I've, I've seen both. Um, and uh, so it's along the way, it's like, okay, if I know how to deal with it, then I need to help someone, someone else. Um, and, you know, don't let what I went through go to waste. Let that be um, a learning experience that, uh, you know, like a purpose for the pain kind of a thing, you know. So um, that's, that's how I got into all that. Uh, but I will say, you know, I've always had an interest in, you know, the paranormal, um, and I think, you know, I don't know, I think it was kind of born into me, but I've, I was raised in church and the church I, I grew up in, they believed in this stuff. You know, I remember missionaries coming from, it had been in Haiti and talking about supernatural things happening, um, both good and bad, you know, uh, divine intervention, but also, you know, the uh, demonic attacks that they endured. You know, so I, so I always believed that I had people in my family, my, my, my grandmother was very, very, very spiritual. And I mean, a very, very deep Christian had lots of experiences that would certainly be supernatural. And, uh, so I, I had that kind of ingrained in me, I guess, uh, you know, growing up, I always knew when we went camping or just hanging out with my dad, he had some of the coolest stories, but they were creepy and there were things that he went through. And, uh, I think all that kind of, you know, stuck with me, but then, uh, you know, it's funny. And before I ever experienced these uh, full on hauntings, you know, I used to love listening to Bob Larson of all people he used to be on the radio. And I just thought, man, this stuff's interesting. He talked about exorcism a lot and things like that. I always just thought it was interesting. And, um, in, uh, 2001, me and my now ex-wife uh, purchased a piece of land in Holmes County, Ohio. And, uh, over the next several years leading up to 2010, the experiences in that environment were absolutely horrible on multiple levels. They were not only the horrific in that 
you know, um, I think I've gotten to a place where I'm not afraid of the paranormal. I probably should be more than I am. Some of the things I experience is like, it doesn't scare me. I'm, I'm all, you know, if you want to mess with me, I'm coming back at you, you know, but, um, it's because of what I went through, but in those environments, still the element of surprise will be used against you when you're sitting there and everything seems peaceful and you see a black mask go through the room and you see it, your cats see it, they react, you know, things happening like that and things that cannot be explained, you know, it, it wears on you. And the other thing I found, um, any little thing that can be used against you to attack you emotionally will be used against you. So, uh, I went through over those years between, uh, you know, we actually moved into the house in 2002. It was, we had it built. They began early in 2002. We bought the land late in 2001 and, uh, we actually moved into the house 2002 and the, the experiences, they started pretty much early on. It was hard to decipher between what was paranormal and what was issues where the builder didn't build things properly. We found a lot of issues. We had, uh, very hearing very strange noises, you know, weird things happening. And as it turned out, we had, uh, house inspectors come in and they uh, did, uh, you know, their inspection and they found all kinds of faulty, uh, building practices that needed corrected. And those were contributing to some of these crazy noises, you know, and things like that. So, we ended up having them uh, fixed in the beginning of 2003. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have some health issues, so I cough occasionally. I'm sorry about that. You're fine. Um, but um, we had those dealt with. And I thought after that, okay, everything's great. This is going to be, you know, our, our dream. We're living on a beautiful piece of land. We're surrounded by, you know, Amish farms. The, the land is beautiful. The sky is huge here. There's rolling hills, but not, not hills like where I'm at now, where I'm in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. You know, when you, when, when you go more west from where I am now into Holmes County, it's a lot, it's more flat. It's very beautiful. And, you know, looking out our front door looked like a Thomas Kincaid painting. There was a creek running through the field across the road from us. There was a, off in the distance, a little church. It was just beautiful. But, you know, the experiences and the things that began happening were completely different than what we expected living in Holmes County would be like. So uh, basically, you know, very subtly after the repairs were done, one of the first things I remember after that, I was standing in, we had a, a room when you came in out of the garage that we called the mud room. When you walked in out of the garage, we had a little room with a utility tub, the washer and dryer and a closet. And that is where we uh, put our cats, uh, food dish and water dish. And in the closet was a litter box. So it was out of view and everything. And I'm feeding the cat one night and the dryer door opened by itself. Mm -hmm. And now this is a front load dryer. And, uh, I've never seen a dryer door open by itself until then, you know, the way they latch shuts very secure, you know, so you're, whatever you're drying, cl uh, clothes, whatever towels, whatever it's the door stays shut while they're tumbling around in there, you know, and this door opened on its own. And I thought, that's odd. That is really strange. And I actually did kind of think it was paranormal, but I had no idea, you know, what I was in for as time went on. Um, you know, we, we both began having experiences in the house. One of the next instances that to me is very significant because it was just completely unexplainable was that one night, um, my now ex-wife, she had already gone up to bed and I was getting everything ready to go to bed myself. And I would always go around and check all the doors, make sure the doors were locked. The security system was armed and the cats had food in their dish. <laughs> I didn't want them being hungry at night, you know, and I go in now at this point, this was in the summer of 2003. We had a, a big tabby cat that had, we already previously had, and he moved into the house with us. His name was Moses. He was a big boy. And we had gotten this little tabby cat, or I'm sorry, a little calico cat uh, named Zoe. She was a female, just cutest little thing. 
she was always little when she was a kitten she was really little and uh so i go into the mud room that night i'm checking everything checking the alarm and i put food in the cat's dish and when i did that i saw zoe run into the room this little kitten and she goes over to the th food dish and starts eating and i looked right at her and i thought how cute I put the bag of food back in the closet. I walked out of the room. She was still in there eating. I left her in the room, you know, having her midnight snack or whatever, you know. I walked through the house uh, into the foyer, through the foyer towards the front door, turned to go up the stairs, and there was Zoe sitting on the top step staring at me. She was sitting like she had been there for a while, and she was just staring at me. I thought that is impossible. I thought that had to be Moses that I saw in the mud room, but he's way bigger than her. He's a tabby cat. I know what he looks like, but it had to be him. I just somehow mistook, you know, Moses for Zoe. So I walked up the stairs, uh, past Zoe, walked across the landing, opened the bedroom door only to find Moses was sleeping on the bed with my wife. Mm -hmm. So I was like, this is impossible. This is crazy. So shortly thereafter, I was like, I have to tell her. So I don't know if it was like the next day, but it was very, very soon after that incident. I told her what had happened. And I remember her reaction. She would, she said, don't even tell me that. Don't even tell me that. And I was thinking the next words out of her mouth were going to be, you <clears throat> are crazy. You imagine things or something like that, you know? And what she said next was, there are times when I'm at home alone and I'm downstairs on the elliptical, which, you know, that's a workout machine. And in our basement, we had workout equipment. I had weights and whatnot. And we had an elliptical. The cats were not allowed in the basement because I didn't want them to like end up knocking a dumbbell off on themselves or something like that, you know? So they weren't even allowed down there. But she stated that there were times when she was home alone and I was at work. And she was downstairs using the elliptical and she would see Moses run past out of the corner of her eye and she would think there's Moses. And then, you know, how you can have a two quick thoughts in a split second, you know, she would think there's Moses. And then she would immediately remember Moses is upstairs. The door shut. He's not even allowed down here. So we both thought something's weird. You know, something is going on. We both began watching, um, and this is one place I will give some credit. Uh, you know, I disagree with a lot of stuff Jason Haas has to say. I have a completely different view on the paranormal than he does. But on the original Ghost Hunters, when it was, uh, you know, Grant and Jason and, you know, the original crew, they were proving scientifically, basically, with, with equipment that hauntings are real. These things do happen to normal, everyday people. Those people are not crazy. This can happen to people, you know? And so I respected that. Like, okay, you, you're, you're helping people because you are, you are, you're proving beyond a shadow of a doubt the paranormal is real. And we both began watching that a lot. Um, do you remember the show A Haunting? And if you remember the original oh. series, it was very, very scary um, they were very good at not only telling these true stories, but they used imagery that was terrifying. They would flash things on the screen that would just gave you the creeps, you know? And, uh, we both began watching a haunting. We would watch those shows together. It was like, we both knew something's not right here, you know, but it got stranger than we began having marital problems. I felt like her behavior changed drastically. And I will give you an example. Um, not only violent episodes, things like that, but, you know, when we were dating, uh, we, uh, if, if we watched a scary movie, like she didn't ever want to watch scary movies. We watched scream one time. So we're talking you know, in the nineties, we watched scream at a friend's house and she was furious. She was mad cause she didn't want to watch it cause it gave her the creeps. So you fast forward a few years and now we're living in this house in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by Amish farms, no neighbors close. And she would now be watching a haunting by herself at home while I was at work in, in at night. 
And I would come home from work and she'd be in bed and she'd say, um, oh boy, I, I taped the episode of A Haunting. You got to see it. It's really good. And I'm thinking, okay, cool. But this is such a drastic change, you know? And uh, the activity continued. There were multiple times even during those times because we began having marital problems. Uh, uh, during that time, I would have lots of experiences that I would stay up. You know, we were, we were fighting. We were not getting along. We tried marriage counseling. It was all, nothing worked. It was, it was bad. And I would, I would sleep downstairs on the couch and I was worried sick. I didn't want a divorce. So I would stay up all night praying. I would fall back on my faith. You know, that's where I, what, what sustained me. So that's what I fell back on and relied on. And I would be praying, but I would have this feeling like somebody was watching me to the point that I would stop and I would look around the room. Like, did she come downstairs and I didn't hear her? I, I, it's like, I felt a presence there with me. And, uh, as it all came about, now there's a lot of details I'm leaving out, but there were lots of other like really strange things that were happening. Um, but I came home in uh, October on a Saturday and she was gone. That was it. She had moved out. That was the end of it. And um, when I finally was able to contact her, she it was a couple of days after I came home and she was gone. And she told me that, now, I don't know all the details, but I know this. I don't know what all happened that day that she left. I don't know. But when I came home, there was a crock pot cooking food left on. She was gone. And she told me when I, when I was able to contact her that the night before she left at three o'clock in the morning, she was uh, woke up because she heard someone ringing the doorbell and then let themselves in the house. And I'm like, that's crazy. That never happened. And I thought she's accusing me of letting someone in our house in the middle of the night. Are you crazy? You know, that's what I'm thinking. And, and I said, that, that didn't happen. And I said, nobody came in the house. I was sleeping downstairs on the couch. I would have heard that. And she said, well, I know what I heard, you know? So then she goes on to say she wants a divorce, etc. cetera. Uh, when the conversation ended, I mean, my head's spinning, you know, I'm, learning. Uh, yep. We're getting a divorce. You know, I really didn't want it, but that's what's happening. And then I'm thinking, you know, she didn't accuse me of letting someone in. She said someone rang the doorbell and let themselves in the house. I thought that was very strange, but the activity seemed, <coughs> excuse me, the activity seemed to stop over the next, uh, several months. I was there alone until we divorced in February and beginning of, of February, the divorce was final. And I was there, you know, I was there alone from the time she left up till that point and really didn't have activity. So I kept thinking, was she cheating on me? Was she having things going on in the house when I wasn't there and it opened doors to, you know, did she have a whole nother side to her that I didn't know? And it was she opening doors because how is a new house haunted? You know, that's a legit right. question. How do you live in a new house and it's haunted? That makes no sense. Well, yeah. at least at that time, it didn't. So once the divorce was final and I'm there alone, it was like the bottom fell out. I began having more and more and more experiences. And uh, there were many. I mean, like I had, like I had mentioned earlier, you know, one night I'm sitting there in the room we called the great room. Um, and I'm sitting there across the room from the fireplace. And if I look to my right, if I look to my left, the TV was over on that side of the room, straight across from me was the fireplace. If I look to my right, I could see all the way across to the other side of the house because we had built the house with a very open concept. So I'm sitting there, not even feeling creeped out, not feeling any evil presence, nothing. And my cats, Moses and Zoe were sitting off to my left, but uh, like a little bit ahead of me and off to the left. So I could see them in my peripheral vision, plain as day. And um, I just happened to, I looked up at the fireplace. I, I glanced up and when I did, I saw out of my right eye, a black mass passed right through that open area. Like it came from the sunroom at the back of the house, passed through the open area and disappeared into the foyer. When I saw that out of my right peripheral vision, at the exact same time out of my left peripheral vision, because I'm looking straight ahead, I see Moses and Zoe, both of them at the exact same time, 
their heads followed the trajectory of the black mass that I saw shoot through the room. Damn. So I was like, okay, I did not imagine that, you know, and the strange experiences just continued things that just absolutely could not be explained. Um, you know, so I'm in this period where, I mean, I'm just researching constantly anything that had to do with exorcism, haunted houses, spiritual warfare, whatever. Cause I'm like, I have no doubt in my mind that what is here is demonic. I don't know why it's here. I thought it was here because something she did, but why is it still here then? You know, I tried to pray over the house multiple times, even before the divorce. And I walked the property and prayed over it, but I never was specific on dealing with any curses or anything because I didn't know anything about the history of the land we built the house on. So I was never specific, but um, I had tried that and it did nothing. So, you know, as I'm here in the house alone now and I, and I'm researching constantly, you know, um, reading my Bible, studying anything I can find. And, and, and through that process, I really began learning a lot about how do demons operate? What do, what is it that allows them to be in an environment or in a person that, um, allows them to be there and to possess that area or that person, you know, what, how does this happen? And I started, uh, I came to an under, I came to an understanding on how that happens and what keeps them there. And you, you have to think like at the time, you know, I'm, I started actually, you know, helping other people and I'm having these experiences where, where I'm doing exorcisms because I, 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 I'm Protestant. I do not believe it takes a priest to do an exorcism. The Bible says very clearly in a book of Mark, the gospel of Mark chapter 16, verse 17, uh, Jesus gives the great commission right before he goes back to heaven after he's been crucified, rose again, spent time on earth again, and gave these final instructions right before he ascends into heaven. And he said, go to the ends of the earth and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized uh, shall be saved, but he who believes not shall be damned. And I'm not saying not to use a swear word. That means condemned to hell. And then he said, these signs shall follow those who believe. His very first sign, he said, in my name, they shall cast out devils. So I don't believe, I believe any believer, if you, you know, sometimes there's some homework involved to find out why are the demons there in the first place? Why, what, what needs to be dealt with here? But the, the, a, a, a true believer has that authority. So the, the crazy part was, you know, I'm helping others and I'm having these very dramatic experiences that cannot be faked, you know, of doing exorcisms. And I am seeing very dramatic uh, things during the exorcisms. Like, you know, I know Hollywood sensationalizes things, but I can tell you in real exorcisms, a lot of the time, very strange things happen, you know, and I'm having these experiences and then I'm going home into this house in the middle of nowhere. And I'm thinking, how is this that I can cast demons out of somebody else, but I can't deal with my own house. It was like, it was like a cruel game. I felt like what is going on? I remember like going home after done exorcisms and, and, and being like, so can you imagine how bad whatever is in this house hates me more now than it did yesterday? Because I just cast some of its friends into hell, out of a person and where, where they belong, which is in hell. But I'm in this environment still. I, I would literally sleep on the couch with a Bible open on my chest. That was the only thing that gave me peace to be able to sleep. So this is my existence in, in this house. At one point, um, in, you know, people will say, oh, you know, when they talk about Bob Larson, if you don't know who that is, he's a very well-known exorcist. And they'll say, oh, he shouldn't charge anyone to do an exorcism. And what I say to that is he ne doesn't necessarily, he, he makes it open for you if you want counseling, if you want to meet with him, um, things like that. But he also offers in seminars, you can go to one of his seminars for nothing and get delivered, you know? Well, he came to Canton, Ohio. I was so desperate. I started thinking, maybe I have demons. Maybe I need delivered. And uh, you know what? I paid him to, for him to counsel me. And I went and met with him. And to me, it was like, you know, I can tell you this, what I was going through, it was money well spent because I was so desperate, but he prayed over me. They tried like crazy to 
uh, you know, get something to manifest if there was something there. You know, um, that night at the seminar, they did, they prayed over me more and helped me deal with some things that I was dealing with that I wasn't even really thinking about that I was dealing with, but I, but I didn't have demons. So I go back home and I'm like, okay, here I am again. You know, that was a, I believe a worthwhile experience. It was a learning experience, but here I am still. And I just continued in this environment. It went on from at that point, 2007, all the way up till the end of 2009 and the, the things I'm going through. And here's the other thing. After the divorce, I put the house on the market. I wanted to sell the house and the property. That was all I was getting out of the divorce. I basically let her go scot-free. I assumed all marital debt and I had to sell the place. I knew there was a lot of equity. So I, I thought, well, I'll sell the house. I'll get all that equity. I'll move on. I'll buy another house and move on. I couldn't get it to sell. Now, keep in mind the housing market collapsed during this time, but I was also dealing with, as I stayed in the book, lots of weird games from the Amish and the Amish are messing with me because they want the land. They want the house and they want it for dirt cheap. And it's not, it, it, it's worth a lot of money. The things I went through with them was absolutely terrible. I will tell you that I found out the hard way, their dirty little secret and their dirty little secret is they are involved in the occult. They, they, their, their veneer that they show to the public is that we're very devout Christian people. Now I'm not saying there aren't some Amish that are, of course, I'm sure there's a lot of them that are, but overall, those people are heavily involved in the occult. You can see interviews on my Stranger Than Fiction podcast with one with a, a, a lady who left the Amish and she confirmed everything that I said hmm. and everything that I'm saying now, that they are heavily involved in the occult, witchcraft, Satanism, all these things. And so for me, you know, when I have stood my ground with them and I didn't let them manipulate me, I wouldn't let them hunt on my and trespass on my land, you know. I thought, you know, I treat you fair and, re and respectfully. I deserve the same. I don't trespass on your land. Stay off of mine. You know, right. they didn't, they didn't like that. So when you stand your ground with people who are into those things, like the occult, witchcraft, Satan is, what are they going to do? They're going to conjure their stuff and they're going to direct it to you. And I was dealing with that and there was no question. And there were multiple people that were my neighbors who were heavily involved in the occult, witchcraft. Um, again, if you look up my trailer for the book, Nightmare in Holmes County, the original edition of the book, the first edition, I did a video trailer. It's on YouTube. And I show you some of these valleys that I found where they practice their Satanism. You know, in the book, Nightmare in Holmes County, I show you a lot of proof that I'm telling the truth about um, what goes on with the Amish, what they are into, that they are into Satanism. And um, I show all kinds of proof of that. And, uh, you know, so that was a big problem. And I kept thinking, okay, that is the issue. So now I'm praying more specifically and I'm breaking curses from them and I'm binding them. Uh, these are all biblical pr principles that I'm sharing when I'm saying this. I'm binding them in Jesus' name. I'm binding the demons that they're conjuring in Jesus' name. I'm pleading the blood of Jesus over me, my house, et cetera. But there's still activity. It's like some of the stuff from the Amish is tapering off, but there's still weird activity. And if you remember, I mentioned that, you know, my ex stated before she left the night before that, that she heard someone ring the doorbell and let themselves in. What I ended up finding out, well, number one, over, over the time that I spent in that house, there was a lot of activity in the foyer and around the front door of the house. So in uh, 2009, towards the end, you know, I am desperate. And I ended up finding out this, the whole secret of what I was dealing with. Yes, I was dealing with curses from people that are involved in witchcraft who were conjuring demons and sending them to me. But I was also dealing with what I didn't know was we built a house very close to a treaty line. And that treaty was called the Greenville Treaty. And it is between nine tribes of Indians, American Indians, and the American government. It was from this, <coughs> excuse me, it was from the 1790s. And um, 
what I ended up finding out was, um, yeah, I built my house on cursed land. So it's like the perfect storm. I'm dealing with witchcraft from people conjuring stuff against me. I'm dealing with something that was already here in place before I was ever thought of, you know, for the last 200 years, over 200 years, there's been something here. And what I found out was that land that eventually the American Indians lost, when they felt they were wronged, they did what was natural to them. They were very spiritual people. They weren't necessarily Christians, but they were spiritual. And what are they going to do? Well, you wronged me, so I curse this land. You took my mm -hmm. land and you're shipping me out west. So guess what? I just put a curse on the land and that's what you get for doing that to me. And if you go back to American history, you'll see a lot of this. You see it with Chief Cornstalk and the whole situation in uh, Point Pleasant, West Virginia and all the strange activity there. It's, it's something that has happened throughout history because they legitimately, genuinely felt that they were wronged. Um, but I come along several hundred years later and I had nothing to do with that, but that curse is in place. A curse is in place until it's broken. And uh, the bottom line is I was going to deal with that. It was either going to take me out sooner or later, or I, or I was going to find out what was going on and deal with it. And as I ended up finding out, and it, towards the end of 2009, I found out the whole story. And the couple who had who, who shared the truth with me, the husband of this this couple, he had grown up not far from where I lived and he was adopted by an Amish family, but he never joined the Amish church, but he knew the whole story. And, uh, it turned out his wife was a, a school friend of mine from when we were little kids. And, uh, to me, it was like divine intervention. God, uh, had us basically run into each other on Facebook one night. We hadn't talked in years and she sent me a friend request and a message and we started just chit chatting. And I was like, you know, I'm just going to tell you, I'm at the point, I don't care if you think I'm crazy. I've been dealing with this for years, but my house is haunted, you know, and I told her all this stuff and she said, no, I totally believe you. She asked me where the house was and I told her and she said, well, that's funny. My husband grew up not far from you. I'm going to ask him about this. So they came back then a few days later and they're like, yeah, your problem is in addition to the Amish stuff you're dealing with, you built your house on cursed land. So, um, in the process leading up to the day that we did what I call an exorcism on that house and property, I had a group from a local church. They were well-meaning in the book. I go into great detail about the interactions I had with them. And it's not necessarily positive, to be honest with you. A lot of times Christians do more harm than good because they don't understand how to deal with this. And they have, a uh, preconceived ideas on how things work that are not accurate. So it really wasn't a good experience except for one thing. There was a lady that came to my house with this group from that church. And she had a gift of discerning of spirits, which if you know about the Warrens, Ed Warren didn't really describe his wife as a medium or a psychic or anything. He said she has a gift of discerning of spirits. And they know, that means they know things. They, they know things spiritually. They can tell things, you know. And, you know, it's funny. I have discernment in certain situations, but I couldn't figure this situation out. I needed help from someone else. But the interesting part, when that group came to the house, we were in the uh, that big open area where I had seen the black mass pass through. And we were praying, and that lady started talking. And she said, um, it's telling me its name. Do you want to know its name? And I said, yes, what's its name? And she said, it calls itself the doorkeeper. Suddenly, all these puzzle pieces start falling together. Number one, I know through doing exorcism on people, you're there's several demons you're going to want to deal with in an exorcism with a person. One, there's going to be one that's called the strong man. It's the one that's in charge of all of them. It's in rank and authority over all the other demons. There's always going to be a gatekeeper. The gatekeeper mm -hmm. demon is in control of allowing more demons in and trying to trick you during an exorcism to allow the weaker ones out, but trying to dis, uh, trying to hide that there's more there that are more powerful. And a gatekeeper demon you want to deal with, okay? So when she's saying that, I'm like, this is crazy. It, it calls itself the doorkeeper. And then I'm thinking, 
all these weird experiences around the door, the front door of the house, you know, even going back to what my ex-wife had said about the doorbell ringing, someone let themselves in, you know, and in the book, I tell you all these different experiences regarding the front door. You know, I go into detail about all those, but, um, the one thing that I, I, I will credit this group with helping me with was that one lady knew what she was talking about and what she shared to me. Now I had a name. It also made it a little bit more personal and um, a little bit unnerving. But at the same time, I, I, I had a piece of the puzzle that was huge and, and it was very helpful. So I believe by memory, I believe it was December 20th, I believe. Me and that couple, Dennis and Angela, that had told me about the curse of the American Indians, we performed an exorcism on the house and the property. We were very, very thorough. We were very specific on curses that we broke. You know, pr previous to this, I didn't know about Indian curses. I didn't know anything about that. So I was never specific. And one thing you will find is when it comes to doing deliverance or exorcism, the more specific you are at dealing with the demons and their legal rights for being there, the more complete the deliverance will be. So now that I knew these other details, we were very, very specific. And there was three of us praying in agreement together. Now, the Bible is very clear about that. It says, you know, if Jesus himself said, if two or three are gathered in my name, I'm in the midst of them. So according to what that says, which I believe it, he was right there with us. That's a pretty awesome thing to think about. Number, yeah. number two um, the Bible also says if one can set a thousand to flight, two can set 10,000. What that means is when you have two believers in agreement, the power they have is exponentially greater than what one person can do on their own. So we dealt with it. After the day that we did that exorcism on the house and property, I had no more paranormal activity in the house. I had had the house on the market for two years and 10 months trying to sell it, unable to. It sold so quickly after that day that within 60 days of the day we did the deliverance, I was moved. And I had, you know, the house sold quickly, that it closed. I moved into another house. That house you'll see behind me right now, that picture is a real picture of 225th Street. That's the house mm -hmm. I moved into. And when I moved in, I thought the nightmare is over. And, and, and the reason I titled the, uh, the book Nightmare in Holmes County was because multiple times during that whole ordeal, I would be talking to my mother, who's a very devout Christian. So I would talk to her about these things. I'd call her and say, hey, listen to what happened now. Listen to what I'm dealing with and all this. And, and I said multiple times, I said, I feel like I'm in a nightmare that I can't wake up from. That's why the book was titled Nightmare in Holmes County. So, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I move into 225th Street and I start writing Nightmare in Holmes County because that deliverance, I was delivered of such a terrible thing. And it was in the 11th hour. It was right. I mean, I wasn't going to be able to sustain paying for that house much longer, you know, on one income. So I, uh, you know, I was like, God delivered me. I got to tell people this because it's going to help someone else that's going through what I went through. And, and to me also, God deserves credit for what he did for me, you know? Right. I'm, I'm in this house. I'm writing. I'm starting to write Nightmare in Holmes County. And weird things keep happening in this new house. And the, the question people always ask, and it's a legit question, they will uh, say, um, how do you know something didn't follow you from Holmes County? Which is a legit question because that can happen. And the way I know that is, number one, the exorcism we did on the property and home in Holmes County was complete. It was a done deal. It was over. So nothing was following me. The other thing was, when I was very confident of that, but um, when the weird things began happening in 225th Street, it was paranormal, but it, there was a different feel. It was a completely different feel. It was very strange. And um, the ex some of the experiences early on were, number one, and I don't know if this is paranormal. I think in the long run, if you read the second edition of 225th Street, which is the current edition, you'll know 
why I do believe this is paranormal, but I would have weird things happen. Like I would be going around the house at night, locking all the doors, getting ready to go up to my bedroom upstairs to go to sleep. And I would start to go up the stairs and I would feel like someone was watching me and I would stop and I would turn around and I would look across the living room. And this thought would come to my mind every time I would think, I feel like I'm in a funeral home after hours. Like that would be an uncomfortable feeling. I would think being alone in a funeral home after hours, that's, I would not enjoy that, you know, and that feeling would come across my, or come through my mind all the time. And I would specifically think of a funeral home here locally that I'm very familiar with because, you know, my father's funeral was there. Some of my uh, loved ones funerals were there. So I, I'm very familiar. I would specifically think of that funeral home that was familiar to me. And I would think this reminds me of what it would feel like to be in Lynn Hurt Guy funeral home after hours. And then um, that not necessarily, like I said, at the beginning, is that paranormal? I don't know. But as I look back now, knowing the whole story, I do, I do believe it was, I believe I was discerning something in the house. I believe it was a, an issue of discernment. Well, one night I came home and I went upstairs and opened my bedroom door and my bed was sitting crooked. It was not sitting the way I had it sitting when I left that day to go to work. So I'm like, that's weird. Well, I convinced myself, well, okay, your cousin is here. One of my cousins came and he's like a handyman. He can do all kinds of work. He was wiring in satellite TV outlets, you know, fixing some things that should have been fixed already you know he was fixing some things so he had been working in the house when I wasn't home so I convinced myself when I saw my bed was moved I said well you know what my cousin came here when I was at work today I'm sure of it and he moved my bed for some reason he must have been checking one of his plugs or something and that's all it is I'll ask him about it tomorrow he'll tell me it was him not nothing to worry about So I convinced him because I'm trying to think rationally, you know, I'm thinking there's no way I could live in two haunted houses consecutively, (laughs) especially unrelated haunted houses. And, uh, I went to go to bed that night and I laid down in bed. And when I shut my eyes, I had what I believe was a vision. And the vision was, it was if, as if I was standing outside my bedroom door, looking down the staircase and there was a hooded figure coming up the staircase. And I could see the hooded figure's face. It was an old man. He was thin. He had a creepy grin on his face. And he had the complexion of a body in a casket, like a dead body. And I opened my eyes when I, it was like, I was, it was, it was the weirdest thing. It was like a vision. Like I'm transported outside the bedroom door, looking down the stairs. I see this. And then I opened my eyes and I'm like, what in the world was that? And I'm thinking, okay, I'm not scared. I'm sure my cousin moved my bed. It's not paranormal. Why would my mind be conjuring up these scary images? But the thing was, what I was seeing in the vision was not how your mind pictures things based on memory or what your your mind conjures up. What I was seeing was crystal clear, razor sharp definition. The colors were very vibrant. And uh, every time I shut my eyes, I would see that again. It was like I was outside the door. And this happened about four times or so. So I said, not knowing anything about the history of the house at 225th Street, I just said a spiritual warfare prayer the way I had learned to pray in Holmes County. And I said, in Jesus' name, I renounce every sin that's happened in this house. And I bind the demons and command you to leave or I cast you out in Jesus' name. Just said a generic prayer like that. I shut my eyes no more visions. I went to sleep. Now I told four people that story and I kept saying, I'm sure there's nothing to this, but, and I would tell them the story and I, and I would always say, you know, I'm sure there's nothing to it. There's no way I could live in two haunted houses, unrelated houses consecutively. I know that what we dealt with in Holmes County is done and over with. So this had to be, be, there's nothing to this. I'm sure. A few days later, weird things continue happening in the house. A few days later, uh, my mom and my sister, and my brother-in-law stopped to see me. And uh, my neighbor came over. Now, he had stopped by like two days or so previous and just introduced himself, said his name, shook my hand, and went home. 
Oh, he comes back on this Sunday. It's a Sunday afternoon and he has his girlfriend with him and he comes up and he, he says, you know, you, you are welcome in this community. We all help each other. If you need help with anything, let us know. We all help each other. You know, he said, I'm an electrician. You know, I can help people with things like that, whatever. And I said, well, thank you. I appreciate that. And he said, well, that's the good news now for the bad news. And I knew what he was going to say. And I looked him dead in the eye and I said, you're going to tell me my house is haunted. And his eyes got big. His mouth dropped open like he was shocked that I said that. And he said, yeah, man, it is. Some dude killed himself in your basement a long time ago. And I turned wow. around and I said, I told you so. Because I had told her something's not right here. I kept saying that. I said, I don't know what it is, but something's not right. So when I say that to my mom, my sister doesn't know that I've been having these experiences. And she's looking at me and my mom and saying, what is he talking about? Not this again, you know? And my mom said, no, he, he told me he knew something was wrong. So I explained to my neighbor and in the book, I, I changed his name to Steve. You know, I changed people's names in the book. The details are exact, except I changed names just out of respect because I don't want other innocent people being scrutinized like I'm scrutinized for saying what I say, you know, but, um, Steve, uh, you know, he, he told me that and, and, uh, he then, he said, well, I have other things to tell you, but I'll have to wait till later. And he went back home. So at that point I knew immediately, and I believe, you know, this is just my way of thinking. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, my way of thinking is this next thing that happened, God was downloading into my mind because I knew immediately nightmare in Holmes County is going on the back burner. This I am researching and writing this a book about this house and the title will be 225th street. I knew it immediately. That'll be the real address. And I'm going to put all my energy into researching this haunting. And at that time, I fully believed we'll do an exorcism just like I did before and everything will be fine. But the story at 225th Street was much more complex than the haunting I dealt with in Holmes County. There were other details that took a long time to find out. So I start on a journey of uh, tracking down people that had lived in the house before me. And as it turned out, on March 1st, 1958, the gentleman, gentleman who built the house in uh, 1924 went down to the root cellar in the basement, which had a brick floor, and shot himself in the head. Okay. Um, as it turned out, the weird night that I had the you know, strange vision of the hooded figure coming up the stairs was March 1st, 2010. The hooded figure looked like the guy who killed himself in the basement. I knew nothing about a suicide in the house at that point. I knew nothing about anyone even thinking the house was haunted. I just, you know, had, I did have some things happen. I thought were very strange, but I knew nothing about this. So there's no way I could have imagined that. Okay. So I start going back and tracking down these families that lived in the house. And as it turned out, every family that had lived there believed the house was haunted and they sold it to someone else and didn't say that they thought it was haunted. So the other family, they move into a nightmare. You know, they have things start happening to them. Eventually they move out and sell it to somebody else and don't tell them. So when I buy the house, you know, I'm buying it from a realtor who bought it at a sheriff sale and um, he was flipping the house and I'm buying it from him. So none of these people that had previously lived there had stood to lose anything by telling me their experiences. Furthermore, most of them wanted to get it off their chest because they had experienced tr things. It is traumatic living in that environment. And there were things that Kind of still kind of haunted them to, to you know, it, that's one way of saying it. They still carried these memories. And, and a lot of them said to me, could this have followed me? And I would say, yes, but why are you asking me that? And they would say, because I still have things happen sometimes that I can't explain. So as I, as it turns out, I'm going back and I, I, it took me a little while to finally contact the last family who lived in that house before me. 
This was a dear older lady. In the book, I changed her name to Patricia. We became very good friends. And uh, she's in heaven now. Um, we became very good friends. And uh, we could relate to each other because we both had these horrible experiences. And, uh, you know, because of what I had been through, I could share some things with her uh, about spiritual warfare that helped her with some of the attacks she was still going through. But before I was able to contact her, me and my mother and my sister and my brother-in-law attempted an exorcism on 225th Street. I fully thought we're going to deal with this and it's going to be over and then I'm just going to research the house. Didn't turn out that way. During the uh, attempted exorcism, a lot of strange things happened, including hearing strange voices mocking um, mocking my mother. Um, at one point, um, I had a situation where I was standing at the landing at the top of the stairs outside the bedroom door. I was essentially standing exactly where I was standing in the vision where I saw the hooded figure. Only now I'm really standing there and we're all praying. And I had a vision again. I had my eyes shut praying and telling these demons, you are going to leave. And I have a vision of a guy about 30 years old, a little bit shorter than me. I'm six foot four. So he's around six feet tall. He has brown hair and a medium build. And he comes right up in front of me and he's staring me down like he hates my guts. And he's like staring at me. And I knew I was being sized up like something was looking at me saying, you know, thinking basically, do you have the faith to back up what you're telling me to do? You know, and, and then it like spun around and disappeared down the staircase. And I stopped and I said to everyone present, I said, something just sized me up. And I described it, you know, just like I just did a 30 year old guy, brown hair, medium build. Well, as it turns out, you know, that exorcism, we ended up basically abandoning it that night because we had tried, we gave a very strong effort and we came to the conclusion it's not working. Therefore there's stump something that I don't know about this haunting that I need to find out because it's going, there's something that needs to be dealt with. And, and nothing's leaving until it's, that is dealt with. At that point, I did not know what that might be. As I then ended up contacting Patricia, you know, probably a month after we had a, attempted the exorcism, we're sharing stories with each other. And she's telling me all these horrible things that she's she experienced there. And I told she told me that she hated the house. It was a terrible place to live. She lost her husband when she lived in the house. He died. And that her son was killed in a terrible accident after, while he lived in the house. Well, I described this vision I had during the attempted exorcism of this guy around 30 years old. She said, that's him. That's him. She said, that's exactly what he looked like. He was 30 years old. You know, she goes into, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. Okay. She says that that's him. And I said, ma'am, I'm, I, I, I don't want to offend you, but I don't believe it was him. I said, I think he's, he's in, in, in heaven right now. I don't think it was him. I said, what I've been dealing with here, I said, it's, it's, it's not, it's not that nice. It's worse than that. And I said, but I'm going to tell you what I think. I think that what is in this house contributed to your son's accident. And I think that it demons are very, very arrogant and they will, they will replay the incidents that gave them the legal right to be there, that whatever opened the door to them. So they're very arrogant. So to me and my way of thinking, I was thinking, okay, what's here. It played a role in this gentleman's death. And it's very proud of that. And that's why it's manifesting looking like him. Cause I knew nothing about him when I had that vision of him. Okay. I knew nothing about the suicide victim when I had the vision of him, but I believed wholeheartedly, um, what, what is here is manifesting as those people. And, uh, as it turned out, you know, I, I kept researching and researching and I'm, I'm talking to all these other families. And the bad thing for me is 
Well, there's a couple, a couple things about it. They're telling me their stories and they've never shared them with any of the other families that live there, but the, st- the stories are very similar or they are the same. Lots of stories involving a hooded figure. Um, and they're telling me these stories that are not only coinciding with each other, they're, they're very similar to things I'm beginning to experience. And then I'm living in this house by myself with all this knowledge of the history and the history of the haunting. And it was not a, I was there three months. It was not a nice three months, but as it turned out, I ended up finding out one key that I believe led to the attempted exorcism not being successful. And that was when I found out for sure that the suicide happened in the old root cellar. I went down to the root cellar and I walked in and I'm looking around and I'm thinking, there's a clue here. I'm just missing it, you know? And I looked down at the floor right after I thought that I looked right at the floor and I thought, and there it is. There was a blood stain on the floor, on the brick. So that guy's blood's still in that house. What drove him to commit suicide? What doors were opened when he did it? It's like, hey, I'm attached to that because the Bible says that the life is in the blood. Your blood is what gives you life. Jesus's blood is what gives us eternal life for that matter. Blood is very important. So these things are attached to, okay, we drove him to do this. Now there's another door open. We'll bring in more stuff because this incident happened, but we're attached to that. And until you get rid of that, we're not going anywhere. Right. And I, I, I theorized that this was the case. I went to multiple people I knew who were deliverance ministers. Bill Bean was one of them. Um, I went to people I knew who were very devout Christians and who had been teachers in the church I grew up in that were very, very uh, knowledgeable about the Bible. And I said, you know, I don't want to look crazy, but here's what I'm dealing with. And here's, I'm in a haunted house. And I told him about the suicide, the blood on the floor. I believe there's a demonic attachment to that blood. And without fail, they were like, that makes perfect sense to me. That is a problem. So um, I do believe, you know, I would have had to get rid of all that. I spoke to a police officer and I said, you know, you know how I can go about getting a luminol test. And um, at first he really downplayed the note. (laughs) Cops have to do this. It's just, it is. They can't be they got to be very careful about acknowledging the paranormal because they don't want to look crazy. So I respect that. But, uh, this, this gentleman, he, he kind of downplayed it all at first. And he said, but then he said, look, here's the deal. If that guy shot himself, stuff went everywhere. You might see the blood that ran onto the floor, but he said, there's stuff all over the place that you're never going to see. And he said, you got to get rid of all of that. And then he went on to tell me about, he said, look, I'm going to tell you a story. And he told me an absolutely horrific story that it happened to him that was par- extremely paranormal. And uh, he said, you know, I, I do believe in this stuff, you know, but he made sense with what he said. And I thought, okay, if I tear out those bricks and put in other bricks, what else is splattered all over the floor joists is above where he was standing when he did it. And, you know, I went back down there and, you know, there was something stuck to the one floor joist. I have a picture of it in the book. Is it tissue? I don't know. I don't know what it is. But it's strange that it's right there and it's right above the area where the blood stain is on the floor. So for, to further prove that it is a blood stain on the floor, when I rewrote to 25th Street in 2020 and 2021, it was re-released, I added a whole bunch of chapters to the original book because things had happened since I originally wrote the book in uh, 2011. and. Um, As I found out, I could research things and find out details easier now that I could not find out when I originally wrote the book. And I discovered that the gentleman shot himself in the head, nine something, I believe it was in the morning. He he goes to the basement, shoots himself. And the family assumes he's dead, shot himself in the head. He's laying there. He's dead. They didn't call for help. They called the sheriff and said that he shot himself. The uh, deputy shows up. His name was Deputy Bainter. Deputy Bainter shows up, goes down, looks at him. Yep, he's dead. All right. He calls the coroner. So we're we're talking 1958. You know, things are not as quick to happen as they are now. The coroner shows up. 
He goes down to check the body and he says, he's not dead. His heart is still beating. We have to get him to the hospital. So you think you're, you're joking. Dead serious. And so you figure he laid there an hour and a half or so, maybe more with a gunshot wound to his head and a, in a beating heart that head wounds bleed. So he would have big time usually on that floor on those bricks. Now it gets stranger. You know, I wrote in the original edition of 225th street and I said, I don't understand this. I don't understand why exactly, but I, I, I do believe it's peculiar that I always had that feeling of being in a funeral home alone at night. And in the original edition, I didn't understand why, but I did believe it was, you know, paranormal to some level. I felt like I was discerning something, but I didn't know what, as it turned out, when I researched again, I had some really good sources of information, a local reporter, an older lady who is as a, her mind is so sharp. She's a wonderful reporter. She's a wonderful person. And she was able to give me some, some information. But as it turned out in 1958, when you called the ambulance, there wasn't an ambulance service like there would be today. So guess who showed up to take the person to the hospital? the local funeral home and they sent their hearse. Wow. They came, they took the guy out of the basement, carried him out. The funeral home attendants did it, put him in the back of the hearse, rushed him to the hospital where he then died. I believe that I was discerning the the involvement of the, in, in the event that led to, I believe one of the biggest things that contributed to the house being haunted that in that event, there was a funeral home there trying to help. You know, they were involved in that situation trying to help. I believe I was discerning something that was that was related to that because I find that to be a very, very strange uh, coincidence. But uh, the story has continued. I could probably write volume three of 225th Street. I mean, and, and some of the things that have happened uh, in 20... Uh, 2021, I believe it was, I was driving home from work one night and I was driving past the town where 225th street is located. And I'm on the phone. I'd worked a long day and I was talking to my mom on the phone because you know, if I'm tired, I stay awake by talking on the phone, you know? So I'm talking to my mom on the phone and all of a sudden on the freeway, it's a, it's a, a an interstate. I see I'm going to say a guy, I don't know. It's a figure standing in the middle of the freeway in a strange posture. My initial thoughts were somebody's going to jump in front of cars and commit suicide. They're going to, you know, I don't know why he didn't jump in front of mine, but this, this thing that I saw, I saw it was a black shape. It was a, in the shape of a person. It had very bushy, like straggly hair. Um, I could tell that cl the clothes looked all ratty and raggedy and torn up. And it, and it was standing in a very strange posture right by the line that separates the, you know, slow lane from the fast lane on the freeway. And uh, I immediately, I said, I got to go. I called 911. I reported what I saw. I said, I believe somebody's going to commit suicide. They're going to jump in front of a car. As it turned out, the state patrol responded and the local police from that town responded. They didn't find anything. They didn't find anybody. Now, call me crazy, but I I suspect, I'll put it that way, I suspect that what I saw was spiritual. And number one, it was a black, it was a black figure. They couldn't find anybody when they responded, but it gets weirder. I went to the local police and I said, Hey, you know, uh, and there's a new chief that is not the chief that was there when I originally lived in Strasbourg. I almost said the name of the town, lived in that town. I don't say the name of the town in the book. Mm -hmm. Not that I can't, I just do it out of respect to the other people that have lived there or live there now. But when I went and talked to the chief of police and I said, can I get some more records requests, you know, regarding this house and all that? He said, sure. And I said, um, you know, I'm the guy, by the way, do you remember the incident when somebody called and said that there was somebody on the freeway that was going to jump in front of traffic? And, uh, he said, yeah, that was you. I said, yeah, that was me. And he said, 
you know, this is probably a lot bigger than what you realize. Now, this is now, now into like right around, uh, it's, it's okay. I'm sorry. The original event was 2020 when I saw the thing in the road it was 2020. So now we're, we're into like 2021. And this chief of police said, there's more to it. I believe he tells me that about a month after I saw that thing in the road, a individual got on the freeway going north in the southbound lane, drove a fairly substantial distance until he hit someone head on and both of them were killed. Guess where that happened? Right at the location where I saw this thing in the freeway. I was right by the uh-huh. or that town. The exit for that town, I I I it's I go by the exit number, you know. Um, but that's right where it happened was near that exit. Later on, a young lady from a town, you know, probably a how a half an hour north of that town, got in her car, drove south on the interstate, pulled over at that exit, shot herself in the head and committed suicide. God. That's okay. wild. I can prove all this. It's not like, you know, and I, that's the thing is I know this stuff I say sounds crazy. I know that I could be called a liar, but if, if somebody's going to call me that number one, good luck. Cause I don't take kindly to that. Number two, I have proof. You're going to have a really hard time explaining how is this all coincidental? How is that? You know, and I can prove number one, I have the recording of my nine one one call. I have the, uh, the uh, documentation showing the, I have the crash scene report with all the pictures from the head on collision, which I believe was suicide. Cause I don't think you can drive that far with people getting out of your way and not know you're going the wrong direction. All right. And then another individual drives right to that location and commits suicide. I believe what I saw was a spirit of suicide. And I believe that it was linked to that house, you know, um, it sounds crazy, but it's, there's an awful lot of coincidences if, you know, if I'm wrong, but at what point are these no longer coincidences? And there, exactly. are, there are details in the second edition of 225th street, which is what's available right now of other instances that, okay, decide for yourself if this is a coincidence, but it's very strange. And it involves someone who had been in the house when I lived there needing a deliverance from a demonic attachment that this individual did not even know that she had, but she had all these health problems that came on after that. Years later, we figured out, wait a second, this might be linked to that based on incidents that she had in the house. So as it turned out, we did a deliverance and and severed any demonic attachments from this individual on that same day which was Mother's Day 2014, the Patricia, the older lady I befriended, her other son who had also lived in the house had gone missing. She had done a oh missing persons report and he w- went missing from a town in Ohio, was later found in Manning, South Carolina in a ditch, deceased. No cause of death was able to be determined. And to to, to make matters worse, it was determined that he died on Mother's Day 2014, which was the exact same day that we did the deliverance on the person who had the attachment. That's strange. Um, Is it possible that we, you know, severed something away from this, this individual? And and, and when I, when I do that, I say, you are going to hell. That's where you belong. Hell was created for demons. Go there. You know, No, no uncertain terms. I say that, you know. And of course, I don't say that in my, in my say so or my authority. I say in Jesus' name. That's where all the power, okay. where all the authority is. Nothing's going to listen to me because I said it. It's going to be based on his name, okay? What are the chances that that was not possibly reassigned to him and it cut, contributed to his death? I can't prove it, but I can tell you that it's, it's a huge coincidence that those two incidents happened on the same day. Furthermore, if you're familiar with the missing 411 books from mm-hmm. David Pilates, I have believed all along since I first heard about those, and I'm a huge fan of his and his books. I, I just think he's an awesome individual. But I've always believed whatever is happening to these people is demonic. 
I personally think, you know, these portals in woods, the cryptid stuff, UFOs, all that. I, I personally believe all of that is demonic. But that's my opinion on it. But here's the thing. I've always believed these disappearances are demonic. It is very strange that this individual who disappeared and then was later found dead in a body of water, the details are almost exact to some of the cases that he that David Polites wrote about and described in, in his books. The person went missing. They're unaccounted for from the time they went missing until they were found dead. Um, other than this individual at some point must have been in a Hardee's restaurant in South Carolina because when the local police did the missing, when his mother did the missing persons report and they were investigating, Excuse me, I'm sorry. When that happened, they called his cell phone number. A, a woman answered the phone and he said, who is this? And she said, I'm so-and-so. I work at a Hardee's restaurant in South Carolina. I'm answering the phone because it was left here. So we're saving it for whoever lost it. They can come back and get it. And he told her who the phone belonged to and said, if he comes back for it, um, please let tell him to contact his mother. She's very worried. Well, then they find him dead. Another thing that happens in a lot of those missing 411 cases is the person is separated from their phone. There's something very strange that happens regarding their cell phone before they die. They are found in bodies of water. Um, there, There is no cause of death able to be determined with an autopsy. So it's very strange. you know. And not to interrupt you, but Wayne and I have done several missing person cases mm -hmm. like we just touched on um michael hair and he just he just vanished yeah not a trace yeah. nothing he just it's, disappeared it's very strange you know and uh i know there's people who want to disappear but whatever there's also cases like what you're referring to there's some of these cases david polites talks about they're trying to find the person and they have all these crews out looking for this person, trying to find them and save them. Then there's cases where they see their footprints and then the footprints stop. Yeah. And they're gone. And they're just up and they're like, where did they go? Why did their footprints just stop? You know, it's yeah, definitely strange. There's so many of these missing 411 cases where the body inevitably ends up being found in a location that was very thoroughly searched. Absolutely. Previously. That's absolutely true. Yeah, that's absolutely well. Look at the look at the case of uh, Riley Strain. He just went he went missing, and they too found him in a body of water. He didn't have his his cell phone. He didn't have his pants. He didn't have his shoes on. The um, police department that did the investigation, he was taken to the coroner, and an autopsy was done, and they found no water in his lungs which means he was dead before he got put in there. Exactly. exactly. Well, that's and the same thing. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. I was just going to say, but they're saying that no foul play was involved. That well, is how? funny. That is very funny because that is exactly what they said in this case. Mm -hmm. And they said, I investigated it as best I could for his mother. I said, I'll look into this. I'll see what I can find. I contacted the, uh, the coroner who, uh, did the, uh, autopsy mm -hmm. and I, th I believe his name was either i think his name was hayes samuels and i contacted his office and i said i would like to foia all the records you have on this case um everything the death certificate the autopsy report the police re i want everything and they said well in ohio you could do that but not in south carolina because um in south carolina we're one of four states that whatever happens after death, as far as an autopsy, death certificate, whatever, is still considered part of your medical record. So we will not release that to you. But the lady said, she was the assistant to the coroner. She said, what do you want to know? That? I, I, she said, why are, why are you asking? And I said, I'm a friend of his mother. And she, you know, she never got closure. She doesn't understand what happened. And, and, you know, I'm just trying to help her. And she said, uh, well, I'll discuss the case with you. I just can't give you the documents, but I will discuss the case. And she said, um, what do you want to know? And I said, 
what killed him? And she said, it's a very strange case. She said, it's a very weird case. We don't know. And I said, did he have drugs in his system? And she said, a little bit of caffeine and a little bit of alcohol, not enough to do anything. That was her exact words. So my belief is he had a cup of coffee the day he died and mm -hmm. the alcohol wasn't alcohol he consumed. It was alcohol that was in his bloodstream because his body was decomposing in that, in that water. Cause you can mm -hmm. have, you can have alcohol in your blood from decomposition, but she said it wasn't enough to do anything. So again, I don't believe he drank it. I believe that he probably had a cup of coffee and then something happened to him and he was, he died. Obviously he didn't drown because mm -hmm. they would have, they, they would have been able to tell that. But the exactly. strange part is exactly what you just said. We don't know what killed him, but there's no foul play involved. Exactly. And that's exactly what they said in the Raleigh strain case. Yeah. It's we don't know what strange. happened. Hopefully, hopefully everyone that's watching tonight also follows the, the podcast paranormal odyssey. Cause a lot more people listen to it than, than view this and Patrick, I'll be taking the audio from this and uploading it to, to podcast. So we'll reach a lot more people Very good. that way. But starting, I mean, tomorrow coming out, it should be available around midnight tonight. I'm starting this series that I'm doing. It's called Missing in the Smokies. Now, I'm right here at the Smoky Mountains. Mm -hmm. And Tiffany and I have been talking a lot about missing people lately. And I'm going to do a few cases the, from of missing people in the Smokies. And tomorrow, uh, the Trini Gibson case, I'm going to be talking about. A lot of you probably don't know who that is. I didn't know who she was until I started looking into it. But uh, Chris Milner here just popped up. Uh, when I lived in Boone, North Carolina, Martin Roberts' disappearance and disappeared, and nothing has been seen in eight years. So I'm going to look into him as well. Mm -hmm. There's something going on yes. with these missing people cases, and I'm really glad that you brought that up, Patrick. I'm, I'm going to tell you something else that's interesting. On my podcast, Stranger in the Fiction podcast, I interviewed a guy who claims that he was one of the original people that went to David Polites and said, you need to investigate these strange disappearances in national parks. This guy was a park ranger. His name's Christopher George. I interviewed him twice on my podcast. And one of the interesting things, and again, like I said, my whole belief on all this is that, okay, there's something that's so sinister, its goal is to kill human beings. And to me, that's, that's, that's demonic. It's something that hates people, which demons do. They hate us. We're made in God's image. They want to destroy us. They love suffering. They love to hurt people, you know. But the interesting part was he talked about, he had many stories. It's episode two of the Stranger, Stranger Than Fiction podcast. He had many stories of uh, really strange things that he witnessed himself in national parks. One of them was what he called the predator. If you've seen the movie Predator, do you remember how that thing would move through and it would blend in? It was like transparent. Yep. Okay. When we talked about it on the podcast, I was like, yeah, there's no doubt. I, I really believe this is all demonic, you know? And the funny part was there's another lady I interviewed I don't remember what episode. There's another person I interviewed who went through a very severe demonic haunting. And one of her stories was she saw something approach her in the house when she was a child and lived in this house. It was haunted. And it was in the shape of a, like a person, but it was transparent. You could see it was there, but it, and it walked like right up to her and almost looked like water. She said, that sounds an awful lot to me, like what this predator thing looks like. There was another case where there was a woman a few months ago messaged me and she was like, I'm going through some spiritual attacks, blah, blah, blah. And I, I was, I was working out when she sent me the message and I was like, I don't know. I just like felt like, okay, let's deal with this right now. So I called her and I said, Hey, let's pray about this right now. And we did. And it was very strange. Cause when we, when I was praying over her, her dog started reacting, barking like crazy. It was, it was very strange, but <clears throat> she had had an experience where she saw something she, and she's describing this thing to me that it's transparent. It looks like it would be in the shape of a person, but you can see right through it. You know, she's saying the same things and I'm like, man, it's, it's uncanny, the similarities, you know, but those, yeah. those missing cases are very interesting. They're, it's crazy. 
Okay. And I want to ask you something, but I'm going to be respectful of your time because we're an hour and 40 in, but hey, I'm cool with that. I've enjoyed it. <laughs> okay. So we went over a case and his name is um, Vescali Gorgos, I think. Yeah. Okay. So he at the time was what, Wayne in his 60s when he so, went yeah. missing? Okay. Yeah. He goes to town all the time. This is this is routine. Mm -hmm. He goes to town, sells his cattle, comes back home a couple of days later. He left seemingly to go sell his cattle and come back home just like a normal every day. Except he didn't come home. He didn't come home to the point to where 30 years had passed. His family still grieved him, still had memorials for him. 30 years later... Patrick, he showed back up at his house. He showed back up at his house. He was 93 or 95, wearing the same thing he had on the day he left to go sell his cattle. Obviously, he had he aged. He still had the okay. bus ticket. He still had the yeah. same bus ticket in his coat he still had, that he had yes. from that day that he that was missing weird. 30 years prior. Yes. The neighbor saw a car that pulled up to his gate. He got out as soon as he shut the door, the car was gone. But 30 years, where are you going to go for 30 years? Yeah. I, and there, I mean, there was a case where a guy went to the store to get cigarettes and bread. He was gone for 25 years, came back 25 years later to the same house with a pack of cigarettes and a loaf of bread. I, it, my opinion only, it involves some kind of a portal. Yeah. That's what, that's what I'm thinking. That. And, um, you know, there, there, there's, there are these cases. It's not, it's not science fiction. It's not crazy. There really are these cases. And, um, you know, what else would explain how that could happen? You know, it, it is very strange. I personally found the, uh, cases that David Pilates did for a while about the weird amnesia cases to be very strange people having, you know, uh, disappearing and then they find them someplace really far away and they have no idea who they are how they got there nothing and yeah. that that's all strange you know but those cases like that like what you're saying that is just so weird um i'll give you another one that i think you know i've always been fascinated by the uh, ghost on flight 401 case Mm -hmm. And I believe that's true. I believe those are credible people saying those things. But I always felt like, okay, what you have there, I don't believe they ever saw the ghost of one of those pilots that died. I believe what was there because the, the, what the people's experiences were, it was horrific. Mm -hmm. And they would appear in a solid form. Okay. Let's say, a how is a human spirit going to have the ability to appear in a solid form? I don't believe they do. I go, a demon would. A demon can do all kinds of stuff. Angels in the Bible appeared as men. But they were angels. Uh, demons mm -hmm. are fallen angels. That's my belief on demons. A lot of people don't like when I say it. I say, no, I'm sorry. That is the biblical view of what they are. And right. um, they can appear as, as in solid form. And um, it, it's just very strange that, okay, that case of uh, Ghost on Flight 401 isn't it weird that it happened in Miami? The crash happened in Miami, the whole thing, which is right by where the Bermuda Triangle is. That's one of the corners yeah. of the Bermuda Triangle. It's yeah. weird. Is it coincidental? I don't know, but it's certainly interesting. Well, it's like Wayne said. I mean, there is just something going on. I mean, there's just something going on. I agree. I mean, yeah. Yeah. All right, guys, we are an hour and almost 45 minutes in typically our, our our shows are around an hour i did want to allow a little extra time because of all the technical issues but we have well surpassed that and, but we will uh, have you back sir i would love because to. i'm i'm working on a new book that's back. got some pretty crazy details that'll be in that too and and crazy proof photographic evidence of of this stuff too so yeah well, uh, all that being said, uh, Patrick, tell everybody where they can find you and, and they can check out or if anybody wants to get a hold of you and, and all that good stuff. Promote anything you want to promote. Okay. Uh, number one, you can, uh, you if you want to reach me, you can just reach me um, on Facebook and just send me a message. If you're sending a friend request, send me a message. Why, you know, where you, where you heard of me, whatever. Uh, just so I know. 
you know, who you are. Cause otherwise I get so much spam stuff. I delete a lot of yeah. it. So it's let me know that, but I can be reached there. Like I said, I try to help anybody I can help. If somebody needs help and I don't charge anything to do it. Um, you know, so I'm always open to help somebody if they're dealing with a haunting or whatever. Um, my books, uh, nightmare in Holmes County and Two Twenty Fifth street are available as Kindle paperback or, um, audio book at amazon.com. Um, and again, in those books, I tell the stories, I tell the stories in great detail, but I also share, you know, the biblical side of it. Like I'll, I'll throw in a scripture here and there. So you understand where I'm coming from, because my goal is not just to entertain you with a scary story, but I want you to understand how to deal with it if you need to as well, you know, uh, just to help people, you know, but, um, that's, that's where the books are available is at Amazon again, uh, two twenty fifth street and uh, nightmare in Holmes County. Um, I, I do have a podcast that's a, I'm a little bit sporadic when I get episodes up, but, um, I have 30 some episodes right now investigating everything from Amityville horror, different haunting cases, cases I've dealt with, um, that were haunting cases that actually were life and death situations. Um, I've interviewed exorcists. Um, you know, so one in Australia, uh, one in the United Kingdom, um, you know, uh, you know, like I said, Chris George, I interviewed him. I interviewed a girl in the United Kingdom named Demi. She shares her whole testimony of being very much uh, demonically possessed and what it was like, how it happened and what it was like to go through an exorcism firsthand account. Uh, it's a it, wonderful testimony. I mean, I, I could sit and listen to her talk all day, you know. But um, there's a lot of different subjects covered on there, even the JFK assassination, you know. Um, so I try to cover things that are controversial, but I think are relevant, you know. Mm -hmm. So you, if you want to check that out, you may find that entertaining. It's on YouTube and on Rumble. I do feel that I get shadow banned on YouTube. I do feel they put their little uh, context warnings because they don't like what I'm saying on YouTube. But I'm going to say what I feel is right regardless. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, Patrick, if you will send Miss Tiffany a link to everything that you want shared, I'll be happy to put that in the show notes. Like I said, uh, every interview we do, we also release the podcast where our audience is much larger, uh, unfortunately. Hopefully one day our YouTube will catch up to it. Mm -hmm. but We're it trying. Yeah. So if you'll send Tiffany the links to all that, I will include it and everyone will just be a click away from checking you out. I really appreciate that. And I thank you so much for having me on the program. Uh, it's been, well, thank you for coming. Yeah. It's, I greatly appreciate the opportunity and uh, it's been nice talking with you guys. I mean, yeah, yeah. It, it's yeah, been, it's, it's been a good time. Mm -hmm. Great stuff, buddy. And also get with Tiffany. We'll set up a round two, buddy. I'd love to have you back. I would love to do it. We have five all open right. shows in June. <laughs> okay seriously i'll do it <laughs> okay <laughs> all right buddy you enjoy the rest of your evening yes thank you so much thank all you right. bye, -bye. bye bye how oh awesome God. was that, that was, okay uh, like the the goosebump factor is real okay yeah. Yeah. um he lived in some houses that were full of nope those were nope houses That's exactly <laughs> what those were and um it wouldn't be me it wouldn't be me i, yeah, I couldn't this, honestly guys i've been doing this for a while and this was the first time i that the only time that i can remember that i said hello to a guest asked them my first question which is always how you got your start and then the rest of the show was just them telling us Mm -hmm. That's the first time that's ever happened because it was just so damn interesting. I yes. didn't want I didn't want to interrupt him. Yes. You know, yeah, I, like I had so many questions. There's so many there's questions that, that our audience has asked that we just didn't have time to get to. I had questions that I wanted to talk mm -hmm. to, but I just didn't want to interrupt him. So I'm glad that we're gonna have him back for yep. a part two and we'll get to ask those questions in. Yep. It was it was great. I'm glad he was a trooper and just came right back on. Yeah, and uh, Russell um, says, trust me, he has way more. <laughs> cool. So Russell yeah. is familiar with him. Mm -hmm. Also, it, it seems like uh, the crawl, what, 
the Crossfire Podcast, aka Strange O'Clock Podcast. You guys are familiar with them. Also, uh, I text you or I commented to you guys. Hopefully, you saw it. You guys get a hold of me. I'm going to check out your podcast. Maybe we can uh, do some kind of cross collaboration or something like that. But y'all, that if y'all don't fun. mind, yeah, if you're interested, it seems like you guys are pretty cool. If uh, if you don't mind, reach out to either Tiffany or myself. I'm going to pop up the web, the uh, email addresses. So either Wayne or Tiffany at paranormalworldproductions.com. Uh, maybe we can do something. Yeah, that would be super fun. And um, I just want to thank all of uh, our people. You have, I'm going to throw this up here. Wow. Bristol coming in for Wayne's office chair because <laughs> he needs a chair. My ass is sore. <laughs> and the Crossfiles podcast, they came in with um, four ninety nine. It's bucks. awesome. Mr. T. Roy, love your face so much. 50 bucks. Hurry up and get the chair. <laughs> <laughs> and Miss an Wendy. Joke. And Ms. Wendy, $3 for all of our research. We appreciate you guys much more than you realize. Yeah, and so much more. Yeah, than, so much more than you, than you realize. Ever, ever realize. We love doing this show, and it, it would not be possible if it weren't for you guys. So we thank you so very much for everything that you do. You got anything yes. else, ma'am? I don't. Stay sweet and spooky. Stay sweet and spooky. You heard it here first. <laughs> All right, guys. Y'all, uh, until we talk to you again, y'all take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. We'll see you later. Bye.